In other words, in the 1960s, when René Tom was inventing catastrophe theory and bringing Poincaré and therefore Gauss and Riemann to, 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 to everybody, Deleuze was the only philosopher in the world that was positioned in Paris to be receptive to these ideas and to be able to link all the different things into one. Today, there are books on chaos theory and fractals, and this whole thing has already become popular science. Today, to be doing this is no more avant-garde than to talk about, I don't know, semiotics or something. <laughs> <laughs> what is special about these spaces, besides their connectivity? Remember, connectivity is a topological, a, to a very important topological property. Well, what is special is certain features of these spaces called attractors. For instance, I'm going to draw right now a point attractor. And what, an attractor is a feature of the space to, that becomes what, remember that the space is a set of possible states. An attractor is one of those possible states or the most probable of those possible states. If you just threw something at random in this field, you would typically land in the attractor. It's of all the possible states, the one that has the most chances to become real. Take, for instance, a soap bubble. Everybody knows that soap film, when blown through, will form a perfect sphere. Now, how, do, how do they do it? Spheres are hard to make. Try to make a sphere out of wood, or try to make a sphere out of metal. You will never get it perfect. And yet, soap, an inhabitant of kitchens and bathrooms, not exactly a fancy thing, can solve the problem of forming a sphere all by itself. How does it do it? Well, the population of molecules in the film becomes attracted to one of these points, the point of minimum surface tension. And as it happens, the form that minimizes surface tension is sphere. Artists can take advantage of this. There's a, an Austrian, I believe, <coughs> no, a German, I'm sorry, it's from uh, uh, Stuttgart. Ot, uh, Frey Otto, it's an architect, engineer, who designed the Munich Olympics, some of the, 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 uh, the buildings for the Munich Olympics, specifically, a building had tent-like roofs. They were beautiful surfaces that are kind of a saddle-shaped surface. They have double curvature, like a horse shot saddle. Technically, they are called hyperbolic paraboloids, but who cares? <laughs> and they, he didn't have computers at the time. With um, wooden sticks, they would not let the sphere form, but the soap film would strive, nevertheless, to reach its attractor, the minimum point, and by doing that, you will calculate the exact surfaces. So he took piece of plywood, put wooden sticks where the towers that would keep, that would, uh, the, the, that would sustain that roof would be, and then tied up loosely hanging threads, cotton threads I believe, from the tips of the, of the sticks, and submerged this thing in soapy water. When he took it out, bingo, the surfaces had been calculated by the morphogenetic power of soap. Of course, there's nothing magical about soap. What's magical is the space of possibilities of soap film. So these attractors, as they're called, are also called topological singularities. They're different from the ones that we talked about before, but they are still unique, remarkable, special points because they are different from all the other points. This is the simplest multiplicity, one with a single point. There are multiplicities that have attractors or singularities that have the form of a loop. They force whatever dynamical system is in that attractor to constantly pulsate. A radio transmitter, for instance, you connect it, you turn it on, it will, it will kind of drift for a while, engineers call those transients because they go away and will eventually get wrapped up around the tractor. In other words, the radio transmitter will be pulsing and that pulsing will be emanating spherical electromagnetic waves which are the signal that the radio is sending 
over those waves, now you can modulate the frequency, as in FM, or the amplitude, as in AM radio, and with those modulations, code words or code music in the signal. But if the radio transmitter was not attracted to a cyclic singularity, it would not, it would not be able to send messages through radio. Now, this singularities give you the structure of a space of possibilities, right? Since every point here is a possible state, and, and both the number of dimensions as well as the singularities in the plane give you what possibilities are more probable and what possibilities are less probable, they give structure to a space of possibilities. Now going back to what we were talking about before, this is exactly what we wanted for the abstract vertebrate. Because the topological vertebrate needs to be simply the space of possible vertebrate designs. The giraffe, the rhinoceros, the elephant, the whale. Is, and, and I don't even know how many dimensions that space has. It could be a hundred dimensional space. No one has calculated. But Riemann, cocky as he was, gave us the N dimensional case. So we already have the software. We don't care how many dimensions the space is. N dimensions can be calculated. All we care is locating the singularities and the structure of that space of possibilities. And those singularities is what the list calls universal singularities. So he gets rid of animal, the category animal, the category phylum if you want to, by replacing it, by replacing a general meaning, a general category, and the necessary and sufficient conditions to belong to that category with a topological space of possibilities, topological space of possible vertebrate designs. Finally, to conclude this lecture, let me show you the relationship between universal singularities, the universal singular, which all together, all the different multiplicities form what the list called the virtue or the plane of immanence. Is his conception of the spiritual. He wants to get to a spiritual world that is not personal because he knows how religion betrays spirituality. If you put a personal God who created us in his image and semblance, basically what you're saying is, we look like him, we act like him, there's a resemblance between the two, and God is personal, listens to prayer, and has desires, he wants light and darkness, and it has to be in seven days, why? I don't know, there's all the time in the world, but seven days must be. He wants to replace this with a truly impersonal God, the kind of God that would scare the crap out of you if you saw it, because you would not find it home. It would not be little wings with little cherubs. It would be something that would leave you speechless. But nevertheless, it is the, the imminent surface containing all the structures of spaces of possibilities, not only the space of possibility for vertebrates, the space of possibilities for, for a, a, a crustaceans, the space of possibilities for insects, for the, for the a phylum, uh, a, uh, whatever it's called. Uh, the space of possibilities for clouds. Clouds come in different types. But there's a space of possibilities for clouds. There's a space of possibilities for flows, turbulent, wavy. Today, physicists and chemists use these spaces of possibilities as a routine manner, particularly because with computers, we can now visualize the structure of the spaces. But when Deleuze was writing about this in the 60s, there were no computers, at least no personal computers. And so he had to make a leap, a conceptual leap to be able to relate these two things. So, it, so all the structure, all the virtual multiplicities form what he calls the plane of immense, the plane of spirituality. 